So Luke 8. After this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of the God. The twelve were with him, and also some with him, women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases, Mary, called Magdalene, and whom seven demons had come out of, Joanna, the wife of Chusa, the manager of Herod's household, Susanna, and many others. These women were helping to support them out of their own means. While a large crowd was gathering and people were coming to Jesus from one town after another, he told this parable. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. It was trampled on and the birds ate it up. Some fell on rocky ground and when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than was sown. When he said this, he called out, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. His disciple asked him what this parable meant. He said, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God has been given to you. But to others, I speak in parables so that though seeing, they may not see. Though hearing, they may not understand. This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. Those along the path are the ones who hear. And then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they not, may not believe and be saved. Those on the rocky ground are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in times of testing, they fall away. The seed that fell among the thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go along their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches and pleasures, and they do not mature. But the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart, who hear the word, retain it, and by pers persevering produce a good crop. Brilliant. Thank you, uh, Gabby, for reading that parable for us. Um, yeah, it's lovely to worship God together at the start of our times, isn't it? And just spend time um, in, his pre in God's presence together. And yeah, as, as, as Gabby was reading that there, I think that prayer for today as we start this is to, you know, pray that God's word would be planted deep within us today. So Lord, as we open your word now, as we uh, look at this familiar uh, passage and parable again, Lord, we pray that you'll open our ears and our hearts to your word afresh and speak to us in new ways, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Great. Well, as uh, Trina mentioned, we're sort of starting out on a, a new series today, which we're going to sort of be dipping through, uh, well, not dipping through, we're sort of journeying through over uh, this, this, uh, the next couple of months uh, as we make our way up to Advent and, and Christmas. But um, these parables of Jesus we're going to focus on, these amazing stories of the kingdom, uh, which bring us really to the heart of Jesus' teaching, the heart of Jesus' uh, message to the world. And of course, one of the things that Jesus was known as was, uh, and has been sort of uh, remembered throughout history uh, is as a master storyteller. You know, he was one who drew crowds everywhere he went. Just uh, uh, People just gathered. They just wanted to hear him teach and see the amazing things he was doing, healing, as we heard at the beginning of that passage, those, uh, some of the women he'd healed as they'd come and to, uh, met with him. Um, but healing and teaching, and often his teaching came through amazing stories. And we might think, well, why did Jesus tell so many stories? Why parables? You know, what, what, why does he go around uh, telling people uh, stories? Why not just say it uh, as it is? Well, partly because I think, you know, as human beings, we love a good story, don't we? Um, there was a, a writer that said, said this, nothing is so attractive or so compelling as a good story. Children, or adults for that matter, do not say, tell me some facts. They say, tell me a story. You know, we love stories. They're powerful. They have a way of getting under our skin in a way that mere conversation never can. They have a way of speaking both to the mind and to the heart at the same time. Uh, that same writer says, discourse we tolerate, but to story we attend. You know, stories, though invented, they open us up to reality. They tell us the truth 
in a way that we can remember and retell. But you know, when we look at Jesus' parables, when we look at his teaching through them, we see that they're not necessarily comfortable reading. They're not necessarily sort of bedtime uh, stories. Uh, one theologian has said, uh, said that Jesus' parables are not platitudes. They're sticks of dynamite. You know, they, they make an impact. They, make, they pack a punch. Uh, another one talks of them as stories with intent. You know, they're stories that, to- that are told for a purpose, told to stir us, told to prod us to challenge our thinking and bring about a change in our perspective. Jesus is in bringing us uh, these stories. He's often bringing us the unsettling realities of heaven, the sometimes uncomfortable truths about what God is really like, who he's really calling us to be and what kind of kingdom he's come to build. And as we'll see, you know, Jesus' teaching uh, often shocked and surprised his listeners. The Pharisees and the religious leaders are often left in the background, uh, uh, chuntering uh, away after, as Jesus tells and perplexed as he lays out the challenge to them. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. You know, it can take some work uh, from us to get to the heart of uh, these parables' meanings. It takes an openness to God's spirit to take these truths in and allow them to be planted uh, deep within us. And, you know, I think this first parable of the sower, the first one that uh, we get in Luke's gospel, is a good first parable uh, to reflect on. You know, it's all about that kind of stuff in it, our willingness to hear, all about our openness and readiness to receive God's word and kingdom reality. In verse, uh, verses 4 to 8, that parable is told, while a large crowd was gathering and people were coming to Jesus from town after town, he told this parable. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seeds, some fell along the path. It was trampled on and the birds ate it up. Some fell on the rocky ground and when it came up, plants, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. And still other seed fell on good soil, and it came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than was sown. You know, it's one of the more uh, well-known parables of Jesus, isn't it? And one of the few parables, thankfully, for today, that Jesus explains to us as well. You know, quite often he just leaves it hanging. Uh, He leaves the sort of crowd uh, to work it out for themselves. But here he spells it out for them, or at least he spells it out for his disciples, In verse 9, the disciples, they come to him and they ask him, you know, what does this parable mean? Tell us uh, what you meant by it. And in verse 11, he begins uh, to explain it to them. He explains what the seed represents, first of all, and then what the four soils uh, represent too. This is the meaning of the parable, Jesus says to them. The seed is the word of God. Great, sorted, word of God. There we go. There's our first explanation But, you know, we might think, okay, well, that's a nice part of an explanation there. But, you know, what does that mean? You know, what does the word of God uh, really mean? And perhaps that needs a bit of unpacking too. But primarily, you know, that word of God, this seed uh, that Jesus is talking of in the parable, refers to the good news of Jesus and his kingdom. You know, right at the start of this chapter, just that bit where I dropped the uh, Bible on the floor and it made a big thud. um, It said, didn't it? After Jesus travelled about from one town and village to another, uh, after this, Jesus travelled around proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. That's what Jesus is about in this part of Luke's gospel. That's what his focus has been, to go around uh, telling everyone everywhere the good news uh, that, that in him a new dawn is coming, that through him redemption is on its way. That by his cross and his resurrection, sins would soon be forgiven. Death would be defeated. The way to the Father would be opened once more. You know, that's the good news of the kingdom of God. And the good news that the the king had landed. Aslan was on the move, if we think of it in Narnia terms. The powers of evil were soon to be disarmed and dethroned. And of course, you know, post-Jesus, this side of his cross and resurrection, we can see all that differently, can't we? But even then, you know, Jesus was busy drawing people to himself, calling people to see that he was that long-awaited Messiah, that in him, God's promise to come and to bring healing and hope to the world was being fulfilled. Come and follow me, Jesus was saying to everyone. Follow me into life. 
So that word then, the word of God, primarily is that good news of Jesus. And this good news, of course, is offered to all. It's cast to those near and far. I love that sort of image of the the sower just scattering the seed. He's not sort of delicately placing them. He's just chucking it out. He just wants everyone to hear this word, to receive this good news of Jesus. And we see that, don't we, with those that motley crew that are following him at the beginning. It talks about the 12 made up of these fishermen, these brusque fishermen and tax collectors and misfits. And then those women that had you know, been shut off from society, were outcasts because of their sinful lives before, because of the things that had happened to them. You know, they'd been shut off and shut, shut out. But Jesus, you know, they're the ones that it talks right at the beginning that had already started to receive this word and follow Jesus. You know, the sower is just sowing this seed out, wanting everyone to hear, wanting everyone to receive this good news of life in him. So this word of God then is primarily, you know, that good news of the kingdom, the good news of Jesus. But alongside that, I think, you know, especially as we open up uh, this series looking at the parables, alongside that, you know, the call is to receive uh, the word of God uh, as, you know, what is our response to Jesus' teaching more generally? You know, the words of Jesus himself. You know, as we go through this series, looking at the parables of Jesus, hearing these stories of dynamite, What will our response be to them? Will our ears be open to hear? Will our hearts be ready to receive the sometimes uncomfortable truths of God's word? You know, if Jesus was who he said he was, if he was who we believe him to be, the son of God, the risen savior, then his teachings really are not just good ideas. They're not just nice suggestions to follow if we fancy it, but they're the words of truth itself giving us a doorway into the realities of heaven, into the wisdom of our creator. So when we read Jesus' words then, we should expect to be challenged and confronted and changed by them. We should allow his word, what he says, begin to define our own realities, our way of seeing things too. You know, the good news of Jesus, which we receive by faith, should begin to make a difference in our lives as well. So then this seed, then this word of God, Jesus says, is that good news of the kingdom, which is received by faith, but then begins to grow in us as our faith takes hold and we, we continue to follow. But then as Jesus explains, then there are four different types of soil, aren't there? There are four different responses to this word that is sown and, and shared abroad. Verses 12 to 15, Jesus explains, he goes through what these different soils mean. Verse 12, he says, those seeds that fall along the path, first of all, are the ones who hear. And then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. You know, a first response to this word of God is to hear but not receive, to hear and not believe. You know, there's plenty in the Gospels as we read who, you know, hear the amazing things Jesus is saying, see the signs and follow him. But, you know, there's lots as well who hear, who see, but reject him as well, who don't receive his word into their lives. And, you know, in, the, in, in reality, that's the case for many in our modern world today as well. You know, perhaps people have grown up with the stories. Perhaps they've heard the news of Jesus, uh, Jesus' saving love but never really attended to it, never really taken it in or taken the time uh, to mull it over. And so those seeds are snatched away by the birds, by the devil, Jesus said, who would rather we didn't hear after all. And you know, there might be a number of reasons why people don't, uh, might hear but not receive. You know, certainly as we see here, there's a spiritual element to it. There is an enemy, Jesus says, who doesn't want people to receive, who doesn't want people to respond. That's why prayer uh, can be so important as we seek to share the good news with our families, our friends, our neighbours. You know, praying through um, that, that resistance there is. But alongside that, you know, the reality for many in our world today is that it's not disbelief or atheism that's actually the greatest barrier to faith, but busyness. You know, many in our world today crave a spiritual life, Many desire a connection with their creator, but there's never the time or the space 
they need to, to weigh things up, to really respond. You know, with so many things vying for our time and our attention, with our hearts given over to other things, we can get too distant to ever give the message of Jesus a real proper hearing. You know, our full diaries or at least our full heads make it impossible. And the devil likes it that way. Um, Corrie ten Boom, a beautiful uh, lady who wrote, uh, who was, was in a uh, Nazi prisoner concentration camp for a time, but wrote some amazing uh, stuff afterwards and went around with an amazing ministry uh, of reconciliation. Once said this, you know, if the devil can't make us bad, he'll make us busy. You know, that's one of the devil's great tactics to, to make us busy. So there's too much going on. There are some who hear then, but the seeds fall on the path on that hard ground, and in the midst of the busyness, the distraction, the noise of the world, the devil just comes and takes it away, takes that word from their hearts. And then secondly, the second type of soil, verse 13, those on the rocky ground are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in the time of testing, they fall away. You know, these hear the good news of Jesus. They receive it with joy, but they don't allow that seed to settle. They don't uh, allow those deep roots to form. So when the time of testing comes, they fall away. Uh, in some of the other gospel accounts of this story, uh, it talks of this point, at this point of the sun, uh, the heat of the sun scorching them. You know, when the heat comes, these ones wither away. And you know, the reality is there is always, always testing in our, in, in our faith, there's times of testings at times. It's always seasons of challenge that come, whether through illness or a bereavement, a period of stress or disappointment uh, with God, periods of temptation or trial. These times are common for all of us that the Apostle Paul writes in one place. And Jesus himself, you know, as we remember his life, he went through that period of time, uh, trial and testing as well. But, you know, what we do before, uh, during these times of testing, and what we do before these times of testing is key. You know, it's not uncommon when we uh, first come to faith, or when our faith first, first comes alive, to have something like a honeymoon period uh, with God. You know, like in a, our human relationships, when you first get together, when you first get married, you get that honeymoon period, don't you, uh, in your relationships. You get those flutters in your tummy. And you just sort of spend hours staring at the other person and doing nothing else. And of course, I still do that with Trina now. Still stare at her for hours. She just looks at me and says, what are you looking at me like that for? But, you know, anyway. But, you know, honeymoon periods are wonderful, aren't they? They don't last forever. But they're, you know, a great time in a relationship. An important time, uh, too. A time to build deep connection with each other. A time for those deep bonds to form. And it's the same in our relationship with God as well. You know, we can use the good times. We can use those times when we're feeling close to him, those times when we're feeling thankful and full of his joy to wonder at him, to pursue him, to get into his word and get his word into us, to enjoy his presence and closeness. You know, and that, those periods are, are important. They prepare us, they strengthen us. They root us so that we're ready for those trickier periods that will come, those times of trial, those seasons when it's not so easy or straightforward. Times of testing will come for all of us in faith. What we do before them is key. And of course, what we do during them is key as well. You know, in times of testing, don't drift off. Don't try and go it alone. Get others around you to pray with you, to support you, to keep, on, uh, keep you pursuing God through it all. Testing times can actually be amazing growth times if we use them uh, to allow us to drive ourselves to him rather than drive us away. If we learn through them to rely upon him and not upon ourselves. And then thirdly, the third type of soil, verse 14, the seed that fell, fell among the thorns stands for those who hear. But as they go on their way, they're choked by life's worries, riches and pleasures, and they do not mature. You know, are we making progress in our spiritual lives? You know, do you know God more than you know, knew him last year? You know, are we growing in our own knowledge and love of Jesus? 
You know, this language of maturing and growing in faith is used throughout the New Testament. Christians are called again and again to go deeper, to journey further, to walk ever closer uh, with Jesus. That's really what discipleship is, learning to walk close, closer and closer to Jesus. But you know, what are the things that can stop us doing this? What can get in the way of us maturing in faith? What Jesus says here, you know, it's the worries of the world, the pursuits of earthly riches or pleasures. They can choke the life out of our faith, Jesus says. They can stop us growing uh, to maturity. Now, it's not that these things are unimportant, of course, but it's more a question of what do we put first in our lives? What do we make our life's priority? You know, Jesus talks of this elsewhere, doesn't he, uh, when he tells us not to worry about what we'll eat or wear. For our Heavenly Father knows we need those things. But then he says, instead, with tenderness and, and love in his eyes, wanting the absolute best for us, he says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else will be added. Now seek first those things and everything else will fall into place. Seek God and his kingdom before all else and you'll learn to live lightly and freely. You know, our Heavenly Father knows we need money to live. Of course he does. Our good creator, of course he wants us to, to enjoy the blessings of life as he's created it. But what is our focus? What's our life's aim and ambition? Is it the worries and the riches and the pleasures of the, this world that dominate our horizons? Or do we pursue him first? Are we pulling up those weeds, those things that so easily distract us? Trust, and trusting that he will take care of us and those worries that we have. And then finally, uh, the fourth type of soil, verse 15. But the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering produce a crop. Ears to hear, hearts that are soft, good soil for the seed, the word of God to be sown. You know, good soil, as Jesus says, hears the word and retains it. You know, that's about us simply uh, receiving uh, the gift of God's grace and forgiveness uh, into our lives, simply accepting uh, by faith in Jesus, um, uh, him as our saviour. You know, that's not complicated or complex at all, hearing and retaining. If you confess, uh, Paul says at one point, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that he rose from the dead, then you'll be saved. Simple as that. That's all we need for salvation. But then there's another part to a follow-up, isn't there, in this. Good soil hears and retains the word, Jesus says, and then by persevering produces a crop. And, you know, perseverance is a key part of our Christian faith as well. Uh, one writer said this, fruit is never an overnight exercise. You know, anyone who's grown fruit or vegetables, you know it's not an overnight exercise. Seeds take time to bed in, don't they, to take root, to break through the soil and become all that they can be. And it's the same in our spiritual lives too. We become a Christian in an instant. You know, as we hear and receive the good news of Jesus so that seed of his kingdom is planted in our hearts. We're his forevermore. But then it takes time for that seed to grow and to develop and become all it can be. You know, through care and through perseverance, as we nurture that word of Christ within us, so the seed of God's kingdom begins to grow in our hearts and produce a crop. So we can begin to be uh, to, uh, bearing more and more fruits for him in our lives, bringing forth new seeds for God's kingdom to be sown afresh. You know, that's the soil to aim for, isn't it? That's the type of heart the sower is longing for his seeds to land in. And as always, of course, you know, soil needs work, doesn't it? Quite often, in fact. You know, it needs plowing and turning over. It needs that refreshing of the rain and the warmth of the sun. It needs us to keep on digging out the weeds and the things that get in the way. And, you know, that's what our prayer can be too. You know, Lord, give me ears to hear. Turn over my heart again. Make it good soil for your word. Help me root out those things that are getting in the way. And pour your spirit upon me afresh so that that word of life can grow and flourish and bear fruit. So may we today then, as we hear this word of the good news of Jesus, and as we sit under this teaching, his teaching in the coming weeks, 
have ears to hear and hearts ready to respond, being good soil ready to receive, that we might grow into all he would have us be and bear fruit for his glory. Shall we pray? Lord God, we thank you for your word to us. We thank you for the way that it inspires us and challenges us and reveals who you are to us. So Lord, we pray that as we dwell on your word to us today, that you will plant it deep in our hearts. Lord, turn over uh, that, that soil within us, Lord, that needs turning over. Help us to be good soil, to receive all that you have for us, for your word to dwell in us richly so that we can grow into all uh, and, and bear fruit for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.